You can't watch evolution in action. It's a common response that evolution deniers often give. Tell them about the mega plate experiment or the long term evolution experiment and they will still fail to see the effects of evolution. To be fair, bacteria and E. coli are not the easiest beings to spot. For people who fail to see the mountains of evidence supporting evolution by natural selection, understanding it by witnessing minuscule bacteria under a microscope is next to impossible. Even experiments showing evidence of evolution on fruit flies doesn't capture their attention. So we need something that is easily visible to everyone to finally understand that evolution is indeed an observed fact. But there are limitations to that and that is time. It takes a long time for higher forms of life to reproduce and produce enough generations for us to see the effect of speciation. It is not easy to compress what occurred over millions of years into a few decades or even centuries. I have done a video on that which you can check out later. And then there is a small issue of applying the right selection pressure to aid natural selection. But the feat is not impossible. And furthermore, such a feat has been attempted and succeeded too. So can we see evolution with our own eyes? Yes, you can. All it would take is to take a flight ticket to Siberia. Well, not right now with the war and everything going on, but once it is over, you may. Hey there, folks with a scientific temper. Today, we are going to be talking about one of the most important biology experiments of the 20th and now 21st century. A fascinating study that was conducted in Russia all the way back in 1959. Now I know what you're thinking, 1959, that was ages ago, what is so interesting about some old study? Well, let me tell you, this is one of the most intriguing studies in the history of animal behavior research and it is going to blow your mind. So what are you waiting for? Let us get to the silver fox experiment. Domesticated animals such as dogs, cats, cows, sheep and so on play an important role in human life. Ever since Darwin wrote his 1868 book The Variation of Animals and Plants Under Domestication, evolutionary biologists and animal behaviorists have been fascinated with how starting at least 15,000 years ago and perhaps even longer than that, our ancestors began domesticating animals. Fossil evidence can provide some clues about when and where the domestication had occurred as well as some information on the stages of change in animals during domestication. But it can't tell scientists how domestication got started in the first place. How had wild animals who are averse to human contact become calm enough for our ancestors to have started breeding them? To answer that question, the silver fox domestication experiment began in 1959 at the Institute of Cytology and Genetics in Novosibirsk, Russia and continues to this day. It is widely regarded as one of the most important long-term experiments ever conducted in biology. The silver fox experiment was conducted by a guy named Dmitry Belyev who was a Russian geneticist. Belyev was a student at the Ivanova Agricultural Academy in Moscow and in the 1940s he worked as a researcher at the Institute of Fur Breeding Animals in the same city. He was fascinated by Darwin's book The Variation of Animals and Plants Under Domestication. The problem of the origin of domestic animals and plants and the means by which they were produced along human history were of deep interest to Charles Darwin who considered domestic breeding one grand experiment in evolution. In his book, he elaborated an analogy between artificial selection, the method by which breeders obtain desired characters in domestic species and natural selection, the powerful force driving evolution in nature. So what is domestication? Is it the same thing as taming animals? Darwin was perfectly aware that domestication was a very different thing than taming. For example, Asian elephants have been tamed for millennia but never became a domestic species. Cats and dogs on the other hand have been domesticated. Domestication involves the formation of a symbiotic relationship between man and other animals. The process of animal domestication involves adaptation, in particular adaptation to man and the environment that he provides. A domestic animal in its most developed form shows four main characteristics. One, its breeding is under human control. Two, it provides a product or service useful to humans like milk from cows or affection from dogs. 
three, it is tame and four, it has been selected away from its wild ancestors. Domesticated animals and plants have accompanied humans since at least 13,000 to 15,000 years ago and the dog was probably the first domestic animal. With the information from Darwin's book and from his own experience of breeding, Bellier was well aware that many domesticated species share a lot of common traits. This includes facial and body features, reduced stress hormone levels, floppy ears, mortal fur and short curly tails. Today, these traits are known as a domestication syndrome. Bellier was interested in why the domestication syndrome exists. Humans domesticated animals for many reasons, but regardless of what they are domesticated for, like transportation, food, companionship or protection, domesticated animals over time begin to accumulate traits in the domestication syndrome. Why? Bellier hypothesized that the one thing our ancestors always needed in a species they were domesticating was an animal that interacted socially with humans. We can't have a domestic animals to be trying to bite our heads off. And so he hypothesized that the early stages of all animal domestication events involved choosing the calmest, most pro-social toward human animals. Bellier further hypothesized that all of the traits in the domestication syndrome were somehow linked to genes associated with tameness. But he wasn't sure how and why. So what do you do in science when you are unsure about a hypothesis? Sit and pray or meditate for the information to be downloaded via a Wi-Fi connection from a supernatural source? Never. You conduct experiments. And that is exactly what Bellier did. His goal was to study the domestication of animals and so he decided to use foxes for his study. Now foxes were never domesticated before. The reason was simple. Foxes are pretty wild animals and they don't like humans very much. So they were a perfect test subject if you want to try domesticating them. Bellier chose the silver fox, a variant of the red fox for his study. Bellier also recruited 25 year old Ludmila Trutt to his team. Trutt quickly became the lead researcher on the experiment working with Bellier on every aspect from the conceptual to the practical. The experiment wasn't easy. For one, the fox species are hard to domesticate. They were ready to bite the experimenters if they could get a chance. And they would not breed easily in cages. So Trutt went around fur farms and started collecting the tamest foxes. They began with 30 male foxes and 100 vixens, most of them from a commercial fur farm in Estonia. From the beginning, Believ chose foxes solely for tameness allowing only a tiny percentage of male offspring and a slightly larger percentage of females to breed. Every generation, he and his team would test hundreds of foxes and the top 10% of the tamest would be selected to parent the next generation. They developed a scale for scoring tameness and how a fox scored on the scale was the sole criteria for selecting foxes to parent the next generation. The foxes were not trained in order to ensure that the tameness was a result of genetic selection and not of environmental influences. For the same reason, they spent most of their lives in cages and were permitted only brief encounters with human beings. They decided they would always approach the foxes slowly, opening the cages slowly and reaching into it slowly with some food held in a gloved hand. When they did, some of the foxes lunged at them. Most of them backed away and snarled. So Believ came up with a plan to make them more friendly and less aggressive towards humans. He started by taking a group of foxes and selecting the ones that were the least aggressive towards humans. He then bred those foxes with each other and continued doing this for several generations. When a pup is one month old, an experimenter offers it food from his hand while trying to stroke and handle the pup. The pups are tested twice, once in a cage and once while moving freely with other pups in an enclosure where they can choose to make contact either with the human experimenter or with another pup. The test was repeated monthly until the pups are six or seven months old. At the age of seven or eight months, the pups were given a tameness score and placed in one of three groups. The least domesticated in one group and those that allow humans to pet and handle them but were not very friendly in a second group. The third group contained foxes that are friendly with humans. At first, the foxes were just less aggressive towards humans. They were calmer and more docile than their wild counterparts. But they still weren't exactly cuddly pets. However, 
as the experiment continued something really strange started to happen the foxes started to become more and more friendly towards humans and they even started to display some behaviors that you would normally associate with dogs and cats after only six generations Bellieve and his team had to add another category which comprised of the domesticated elite foxes which are eager to establish human contact whimpering to attract attention and sniffing and licking experimenters like dogs but here is where the experiment gets really interesting as the foxes became more friendly towards humans they also started to display some really weird behaviors for example some of the foxes started wagging their tails when they saw humans just like dogs do and some of them even started to seek out human attention just like a cat or dog would some of them started to bark some of them even started to pant like they were overheating or something it is almost like they were trying to imitate dogs or maybe they just forgot that they were foxes and if you thought that was weird wait until you hear about the physical changes that happened to the foxes over time the foxes started to change in appearance they developed floppier ears shorter tails and even started to change color they went from being mostly silver to having black and white spots just like some dog breeds after 8 to 10 generations the tame foxes began to develop multicolored coats a trait found more in domesticated animals than in wild ones this was followed by the development of floppy ears and rolled tails similar to those in some breeds of dog after 15 to 20 generations a very small percentage of the tame foxes developed shorter tails and legs they even lost their musky fox smell bellier's hypothesis was being proved right the foxes were evolving right in front of our eyes but the changes were in just physical the domesticated foxes also showed changes in their behavior temperament and even in their hormone levels the first physiological change detected in the tame foxes was a lower adrenaline level then they noticed a higher serotonin level they became much more like domesticated cats in terms of their ability to bond with humans and their willingness to follow commands although they couldn't understand the difference in commands like no and yes they still knew that they were being told something cats even today find it difficult to decipher commands compared to dogs so you could say the foxes were more cat-like than dogs when it came to communication it's almost like the experiment had somehow unlocked a genetic blueprint for domestication that was hidden inside these wild animals all along. Trutt wrote in 1999 that after 40 years of the experiment and the breeding of 45,000 foxes over 30 to 35 generations, a group of animals had emerged that were as tame and as eager to please as a dog. Some of them even loved to get their belly rubbed. Some of the foxes had been trained to fetch and sit. So what did the experiment show? It showed that selecting for a single behavioral characteristics allowing only the tamest, least fearful individuals to breed resulted in changes not only in behavior but also in anatomical and physiological changes that were not directly controlled. The inability of wild animals to pick up human signals is caused by their fear of humans. While Believ and his team didn't select for a smarter fox but for a nice fox, they ended up getting a smart fox. Darwin was right. The selection pressure that we applied led to the foxes losing their foxy behavior and becoming more doggy-like. I find it an interesting project to understand domestication of wild animals and the evolutionary process of natural selection when selective pressures are applied to animals. If we can do it in a matter of few decades, can you imagine what can be achieved naturally in 3.5 billion years when nature applies several selection pressures amongst the animals and plants? Do you want a more direct evidence that evolution is in fact a scientific fact? Bellieve died of cancer in 1985. After his death, his experiment is still continued by Trutt. As of August 2016, there were 270 tame vixens and 70 tame foxes on the farm. Who knows? As the years pass, they might be successful in creating a new species, one which is neither similar to the wild fox nor looks like the tame dogs. And then all of the evolution deniers can sit and moan, evolution is just a theory. So there you have it folks, the silver fox experiment. It just goes to show that animals are a lot smarter 
and more adaptable than we give them credit for. And who knows, maybe one day we'll be able to domesticate foxes just like we did with dogs and cats. We may have found a new best friend for humans. Imagine a world where you can walk your pet fox down the street or have a cuddly little fox curled up on your lap while you watch TV. It's a wild idea, but hey, stranger things have happened. I am for the time being happy and content with my two cats. Thanks for watching and don't forget to subscribe for more fascinating videos. Let me know in the comments if this information was new to you. You can support me by clicking on the super thanks button or through the buy me a coffee link which you can find in the description. I shall be back soon with another interesting video. Until then, it's bye bye from Pale Blue Thoughts.